time on unauthorized recording or photography is strictly prohibited. There will be no intermission. Thank you and enjoy the performance. program that I've had some time to think about, because we've had time to think about a lot. I like to think that this is a, a, a program of, of dreams, and uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the, uh, the late jazz saxophonist, Rasan Roland Kirk, and Rasan Roland Kirk believed in dreams to the point that he said that they were his religion. Um, and he had this wonderful tradition where he would, he would say, bright moments. And when he would say bright moments, that was his greeting to you. And then you would say back to him, bright moments. So let's, let's try it. You ready? Bright moments. Bright moments. Oh, that's wow. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I'd like to dedicate this program to my family. I'm, I'm trying 10 seconds into the program. Um, They've heard this program a lot, a bunch of times, in the basement, over and over, changing, evolving over time. Um, and some of these things came actually directly from me dreaming these things, oftentimes waking up screaming, and I want to talk about that later. Um, uh, I feel incredibly fortunate that in the time that I spent locked in the house with my family, I, I discovered that, of course, you love your family. But I also really like my family. And, um, you know, it's, it's an incredible luxury. And I'm very grateful to them for all of their support. And I told my daughter I would do this dance move for her. <laughs> so we got that out of the way. I promise no more dancing. Thank you. Um, the first piece that I'm going to play uh, is very special to me. Uh, there's a young composer who I first knew as a young saxophone player. His name is Ryan Gaelic, and uh, he is uh, watching the live stream right now. Hi, Ryan. Uh, he's at Michigan State, where he's uh, doing a master's degree in, in composition. I met him through uh, a performance that I gave at the United States Navy, uh, Navy Band International Saxophone Symposium. And I premiered a piece of mine there called um, Spiritual and Pascalia. And after I performed it, uh, he got in touch with me and he said, I really love this piece, I'd like to buy it. And I told him, well, it's an, it, this is one of my art scores, so I, I'm not selling it except uh, as a hand-drawn you know, art score. And, and it's kind of expensive. And he said, well, I really want it. So I said, well, okay, well, since you're a student, I'll, I'll, I'll we'll, figure out a negotiate a price, you know, and, and, um, and then that was it. You know, I, I did it and I boxed it up and I sent it to him and um, quite a while later, and this was 2016 for, for reference, 2016, um, he sends me an email and he says, I've programmed your piece on my senior recital. He's a student at a, a college in New Jersey at the time. And can I come down and get a lesson with you on it? And I said, of course you can. So he, drove, he drives down to JMU from New Jersey um, and I give him about a two hour lesson on my piece. And then he gets back in the car and he drives back to New Jersey. Uh, you know, and I, and I just felt like, oh my gosh, this poor kid, he spent 11 hours in the car probably in one day you know, to get this lesson with me. Um, but I showed him a couple of little secrets and um, it, was, it was really nice. And he's a really sweet person. I, I felt really lucky to get to know him. So fast forward to 2020, he's, he's a, a, a graduate student now and he's written this piece and he's dedicated it to me, um, which is very, very moving. And I felt bad because at first it was 2020 and we were going to try and premiere it online and I just didn't have the energy, you know, from, we were all trying to figure out online teaching and, 
you know, we were afraid that the world was going to end, and you know, so the last thing I could do is invest in learning a new piece. But I have learned it now, and so so this will be the um, the live performance premiere of, of Ryan's piece called Oasis. And there's little tiny program notes that I'm sure you can't read, but I'll just give you the very quick version. The quick version is that um, he was inspired by looking at this video that showed the popular Google um, uh, search phrases for any given week across time. And what he noticed is that, you know, yeah, of course, something is interesting, and then suddenly no one's interested in it anymore and interested in the new thing. And this cycle goes on and on and on. So he, he describes this, this piece, Oasis, as an attempt at, at his attempt at processing and creating a space that takes a break from this constant shifting of one you know, tragedy or one you know, fabulous thing to the next, where we can actually let one story play out. One story to, to play out. So this is Ryan's piece, Oasis.
like the little workout. This instrument is called duduk. It's from Armenia. It's in fact the national uh, musical instrument of Armenia. Um, we lost the, the great, great um, dudukist this past year, Jivan Gasparian. And you've heard Jivan Gasparian, even if you don't think that you have. Um, he, was, he was first made, uh, made popular through uh, Peter Gabriel, and uh, the Duduk became um, really pretty sensational um, around the time of the film um, The Last Temptation of Christ. And then this, this instrument went on to become more and more popular, and now it's in film scores and sci-fi movies. We, we have a joke in my house, when the, when the Duduk plays on the TV, we say, cue the Duduk player, and he comes out of the closet and he plays the thing, and then he goes back in again. It's made from apricot wood, and this big gigantic reed, which sounds nothing like what it looks like it should sound like, but very much the same as, a, as a, the material as a saxophone reed, just obviously a double reed and much heavier. <laughs> make some drones here on my looper, so be very quiet.
the moment. All right, for our next trick, I'm very excited to give this premiere of a collaborative work between myself and my wonderful colleague, Eric Ginevan. Eric can't be here tonight because he's at some fancy schmancy retreat uh, thing in New York. It's actually wonderful. I'm just being a wise guy. So Eric contacted me and said, I have this idea. I would like to come to your house, record a few things on the saxophone, and then take those things and convert them into digital, virtual, musical instruments. So in other words, I could make a weird sound, and then you could take that sound and explode it all over the keyboard, and basically have a piano that could play this particular sound. And then using granular synthesis, he's able to manipulate those sounds and, and creating into what I call a, a, a dreamscape. And when I first listened to it, when he sent it to me, um, I, I immediately slipped into sort of this waking dream like I was falling through space. It was just like this galactic kind of a sound. The piece is called Howl. It, an extraordinary coincidence, when he sent it to me, I asked him, did I tell you about my Howl dream? And he said, no. This is one of those dreams where I woke my family up. So a, a, a musician that I played with um, and that I admired very much, uh, the drummer Bob Galati uh, from Boston. He passed away in, in 2020. Um, and it was shocking. No one knew that he was sick. And uh, I was processing his death. I grew up listening to a band in Boston called The Fringe uh, with saxophonist George Garzon, who is one of my idols. And so when I had the chance to make my own solo CD when I was 21 years old, the owner of, of the label, Ken Dorn, who also just recently passed away, Ken, travel in, in peace, brother, um, he said, you got to get somebody famous on the record. So I said, can I get Bob Galati? And he said, well, try. So I called Bob Galati. And Bob said, who are you? And he called my teacher at UMass and said, does this kid have the money? And he said, yeah, I think he has the money. So I got to do this, this fabulous recording and spend two days in the studio with, with Bob Galati, le absolutely legendary uh, Boston drummer. So I had this dream that I was at this jam session. This is at like the height of, 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 of lockdown. And I'm at this jam session, and, and everybody's playing, and I'm playing, and Bob Galati's in the center, and he's burning. He's dropping bombs. It's unbelievable. Everybody drops out, and now suddenly it's just me and Bob Galati, and we're, we're playing, and we're, we're battling, we're battling, and, the, and it's getting higher and higher and more intense, and I don't have another gear. And he's like, come on, come on, and everybody in the room is like, go, man, go, and I don't know what to do. So I take the horn out of my mouth, and like an animal, I start going, oh, oh, oh. Now I wake up to the sounds of myself howling, And my wife going, oh my god, stop! <laughs> Go back to sleep! So that's my howl dream. And it has nothing to do with, with, with Eric's composition, except that it happened to be, you know, this, this idea of, of howling uh, seemed to be simmering in the, in, the, in the air, in the space between us. So, um, the piece is written for as he composed, and I'm going to improvise with it. And the idea behind this piece is that basically anybody can improvise with this piece. You don't have to be, you know, it's not a jazz piece. It's not a, it's not a classical piece. I think it's a, it's a galactic piece. It's, it's super, super cool, and I hope that you enjoy it. And Eric, I know you're watching the live stream. Thank you, brother. I, I, I hope I do this justice.
Thank you very much. It's galactic, right? This could be a slight change um, in the program. I had listed this thing, Other Dreams, and it was a thing I was working on. And, uh, is, is there any fans out there of the FX program, Legion? Yeah. Right, okay, so Legion, is, is, it's in the Marvel Universe. And I'm not like a big superhero you know, kind of guy. But my wife, again, thank you, honey, uh, said, you have to watch this Legion. And I was like, I, I don't have time to watch Legion. And I was immediately hooked on it. Um, for a lot of reasons, I love, I love the characters, I love the acting, the writing, but the music, oh man, the music is absolutely incredible. Noah Hawley is the, uh, the creator of the program. Um, so one of the things that popped up, and I was just re-watching this because, you know, I, sometimes I just got to turn my brain off and, and, and watch. So I was watching Legion, and the Bonnie Iver song, 22 Over Soon, everybody know the song? It's from 2016. Um, it's just a super cool, super cool song. Um, and I thought that the, the unintentional symbolism of 22, as in 2022 is coming, and, and the, the refrain, this might be over soon. 2022, this might be over soon. And the message in this song is, this all might be over soon. And as we're busy waiting to, for, for the bad things to stop, the good things might stop too. I just think that's a very powerful uh, message. So then I had this waking dream that turned into a sleeping dream that turned into a waking dream of me playing Bonnie Iver 22 over soon. And I thought what it would be interesting, if you know the song, the song uses a lot of samples and a lot of electronics, and I have all the stuff here to do that. I'm not gonna do any of that. I'm gonna do it entirely acoustically. I thought it would be kind of an interesting foil for the rest of the program. So, this is my attempt at Bon Iver 22 over soon. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
This concert also will be over soon. The last thing I'm going to play for you These were my father's flutes. He was the most god-awful flutist you ever heard. <laughs> he was a wonderful father. He was a wonderful father. Uh, probably 25 years ago, I became interested in building flutes, and so my father was a mechanical genius. He could fix anything. He was a welder, he was a machinist, he was a pipe fitter. He was a pipe fitter. So I, I went to him and said, Dad, I need some tools, because I want to build some flutes. And he was like, well, could you show me what you're working on? So I showed him, and he sent me some tools. When I came home, uh, this was when I was living in Rochester, New York. I was a graduate student at the Eastman School of Music. I had just graduated. Um, and I came home, and he had these crazy copper water pipe flutes that he made. And some of them played. And I was, I was amazed. And he became really interested in flutes, and I, and I know why. It's because it was a way for him and I to connect. A lot of times we didn't really share the same language because, you know, he, I, I was among one of the first to go to college in my family. Um, my mother was a nurse, so she was highly trained, and my father, you know, knew how to do all these things, and he was very highly trained. They, you know, he was, he was a very, very smart man. Um, but when I popped out, I was a professor. I was two years old and I was walking around, you know, professing. <laughs> so these flutes became a, a, a bonding thing for us. So he passed away from Parkinson's. Don't get Parkinson's. Seriously, don't get Parkinson's. Um, And the flutes came to me. And it was sort of a part of the grieving process was playing all these flutes. So I wanted to do something tonight um, to do two things. To honor my father and to you know, try to connect with him, even though he's gone. He'll never be gone. No one's ever gone. As long as you remember them, they're they're there. They live in your head forever. Um, but I also wanted to do something really unique. One of, the, one of my philosophies with the pandemic was no square pegs. So I didn't want to use technology to replace anything in a way that was stupid. Right? So I started thinking about you know, well, what, what can we do? And I think that Eric Ginnivan's piece is a really wonderful example of this, right? He found a way to, to take some recorded sounds and manipulate them and create this, you know, this, this composition that couldn't exist otherwise. By the way, it's very strange playing with your, with your own sounds and recognizing them a little bit, but through this, you know, veil of, of um, someone else's imagination. And the same thing holds true for Ryan's piece, Oasis. It's filled with little things that he clearly picked up from some of, some of my pieces. But he's put it together to make new poetry that's hard for me to recite, even though I know the words. Some of them, they're, you know, they're my words. So I wanted to pay tribute to another one of my great heroes, Jimi Hendrix. It's important to remember that Jimi Hendrix was a black man, Cherokee descent, so he comes forth from the soils of Africa and America, indigenous America, right? He plays the guitar all wrong. Left hand, played it left hand, made it too far. You know what they say? Ziggy Stardust. Played it left hand. Upside down, thumb over the fretboard. All wrong, right? The things that we were trying to avoid doing, the feedback and strange noises, he, that's where his voice came from. Um, he's one of the most important American musicians, probably one of the most important musicians that ever lived, I think. And in an incredibly short amount of time, what, his, his real career is about like five years, 
and in five years, we're still dealing with it. You know, I'm 49 years old, I died, died, he died before I was born, and I'm still dealing with Jimi Hendrix. So, I wanted to introduce my dad to Jimi Hendrix tonight. 